let's get ready to rumble. Well, we're going to rumble with the Word of God. Nathan Schumann, would you come up here, please? Nathan is going to help me a couple times to start the sermon and to end it. We're going to talk about the good soil of a man's heart. And this is very good soil right here. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, God has ordained strength. I can just picture Jesus calling children Nathan's age to him and saying, if you could just be like one of these, how they trust, and then plant the word in a trusting heart. Would you share with everybody the scriptures that you shared with me? He memorizes scriptures every week. And Jesus said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. For this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. Matthew 37 and 40. That word is going to grow up 30, 60, and 100 fold. And so you just keep planting. Every time, you, every time you harvest a crop of God's word, plant some more. Keep planting the word in you. Good going, Nathan. I'm proud of you. You know, it's important to know where the goal line is. And so we have mission statements that tell us where the goal line is. The object is, is to run the plays as a team, get there together in the red zone, and know that just in front of you is the end zone, and you're there to score. Now, if you're confused and you don't know one side of the field from the other, and you start looking down the wrong direction, the end zone will look like it's 90 yards away. But it's only 10 yards away. God has us in a red zone. So I want to repeat, and I'll, I'll post this in the church, our mission statement is just three simple statements. One is we are here to be a force of God. You are here, I'm here, so that we change the world around us by the power of God and be someone, become, be a force of God. Two, uniting churches. Look how many people in our community and beyond consider us their church even though they go to church somewhere else. They still see us as their mission church. They're distributing food, 20 to 25 people in my community. They think that, they think this is their church. Well, it is. Anybody's welcome here. And if, if your name is written in the book, you belong here. We have two of my good neighbors here, Leo and Muriel, and they're a delight. And I love Leo and Muriel, and they're just a constant reminder to me about the good-natured people and the good-hearted people in my community. I always pray for the people in my community. So being a force of God, uniting churches, and I didn't plan that. God just did that impacting our communities for Christ. Having an impact on communities. What a privilege that is. Rabbi, that's, that's serving God. Impacting people and communities. So this is part three of a three-part series called The Spirit Gives Life. The last two Sundays, if I can review and remind you, we talked about 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. Basically, it says that our, sufficiently, our sufficiency must not be in ourselves. We are not sufficient to do what God's called us to do. But our sufficiency is in God because He is all-sufficient. 
It says, the letter, the letter of the word of God brings death, but the spirit brings life. How many people have just beaten someone up with the word of God and they've given them the letter of the law? No, minister by the spirit and you'll end up loving that person that you're giving the word to. Or you might just decide the best gospel is the one you don't preach. It's the one you live. John 6, 44, it says, Jesus is talking, he said, unless the Father draws someone to the Son, they'll never get there. Nobody will ever know who Jesus is unless it's revealed by God the Father. And that is part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. When you're talking about the Holy Spirit, you're talking about God the Father, God the Son. You can't separate them. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Now, if you figure out the Trinity, I want to talk to you because, to me, that's just tough. But I can... But I can say by faith, I believe it because God said it. But I don't have to figure him out. In fact, I never will. And then in Matthew 11, Jesus said, If you want to unload the heavy burdens in life, learn about me. I'm humble and meek. I'll give you rest to your soul. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, because my way is easy and my burden is light. If you do it by the Spirit, you'll be energized. If you try to do God's work in the flesh, you will be tired. You won't want to be. So we're, we were talking about the last couple of weeks, how to know when a person is a green light person, when a person is really ready for Jesus. We've, um, we've talked about green light people, people who are ready. The fruit is ripe, it's sweet, it's tasty. I got some fruit up here, and most of it, to my knowledge, is ripe and ready for picking. There's some people that are just ready for Jesus. There's some people who are like amber light people. Uh, they're, they're getting ready. They're on their way. They have some of the word, and all we need to do is just help them water it a little bit. Help their soil. It's not time to pick the fruit yet, but help their soil. And then there are red light people that are just not ready yet. Don't give up on them. Read the people. And here's one way you can read the people. Who is friendly toward you? If I just use that term friendly... Is the person you're talking with receptive to a conversation back and forth with you? Is it a person of peace? Jesus tells the 70, go, and when you enter into a house, give the house your shalom. Give the house your peace. And if the, a man of peace greets you and welcomes you, then your peace will remain on the house. Otherwise, you take your peace back. Sounds pretty harsh. He even says, dust off your feet. If they throw you out, just dust off your feet. So who is open? And who is closed? Who's ready? Jesus taught, ask, seek, and knock. If you keep asking, seeking, and knocking, you'll find out who's ready. You'll find out where someone is. In fact, if you ask people their story, let's say you've got a red light person. So you're not going to present the gospel. Maybe, maybe if you just ask them their story and then be quiet and listen to their story. Everybody in life has a story. Everybody's life is important. Everybody's story is meaningful. Stories connect us. The rabbi's story, in my story, connects us. And it has for six years plus. I know a lot about his story. And he knows a lot about my story. Stories connect us. You can always find out if someone's open or not to connect and open up their life a little bit for their story. 
Listen carefully when you ask someone about their story. Try to speak as little as possible and listen as much as possible and remember listening is loving. When you care about someone and their story and you listen, people walk away with a very favorable impression of you because you cared enough about them to give them your time and to hear their story. Now, it's not uncommon you'll ask someone their story and they'll never stop. <laughs> Have you ever been monologued? Well, that tells me, oftentimes that tells me, there's some pain and there's some hurt when a person just keeps, keeps going with the story. Uh, they may keep going, and one thing won't relate to another thing, but I can pretty much bet there's some pain in there, and there's some hurt. And if I listen carefully, I'll find it. So, years ago, someone told me that there's no good reason for someone to open their life to me if I'm not willing to befriend them and become not just friendly but befriend them and care enough about their story and about them to let them into my world and befriend them. We wouldn't go up to someone and ask them, well, what's your gender preference? <laughs> We wouldn't just walk up to a stranger and say, hey, what's your sexual orientation? Or ask them anything personal like that. In fact, even if I get to know them, I'm not going to ask them those questions. But I do know that if you ask people about their soul, their eternal soul, that is about as piercing a question as you can ask. You are asking people to trust you at a level that involves their very soul for eternity. I found most people are willing to talk about their soul when they trust someone. Trust is the building block of relationship. So let me talk to you about becoming a mature and powerful witness. I'll just call it becoming a hundredfold man or woman. In John 6, 63, listen carefully here, Jesus says the spirit quickens or the spirit gives life. The flesh produces nothing and really the flesh accomplishes nothing. What you think you accomplish in the flesh, just watch out. It will be fruit that looks like fruit, but it will not remain. It has to be. Jesus said, it has to be me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Apart from me, you can't do anything. But fortunately, we're not apart from him. Stay connected to the vine because the spirit gives life and the flesh is it really profitable to you or someone else? Now listen to Jesus. The words that I speak to you are spirit and life. Where do you go to find a hundredfold spirit and life experience? You have to go to God's word because the spirit gives life. And every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God is filled with spirit and life. The question is, will we become good soil? And I'll answer that for you. Yes, you are good soil. And anybody's soil can improve. Ask a farmer about soil, and he'll probably monologue you and tell you more than you want to know about soil and about nourishment and what kind of seed goes best in what kind of soil. What gets planted in a certain kinds of soil and what it takes to nourish uh, a soil. So God has pretty high standards when it talks about uh, his word and his word becoming alive in us. So I'd like to refer to Jesus' teaching. It's in uh, Matthew chapter 13. It's also in Mark and in Luke. 
And this is the parable of the, the sower. And Jesus says to his disciples, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the fat of the land. Or another interpretation, if you are willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. God will provide for you when you're good soil and you are willing and obedient and you will hide the word of God in your heart. Now, Jesus says to his disciples, um, I'm going to tell you a parable. Later they'll go on and they'll say, how come you only tell parables? He says, because it's for you to know. It's because you've committed yourself to understanding. And others who have not, they won't have the same benefit you have. In other words, it's just a condition of the soil of their heart. And Jesus says, well, if you don't know this particular parable, how will you then know every parable? Because every parable revolves around God's word. Let's take a look here. In verse 3. 13.3 He told them many things in parables. Without a parable, he didn't teach. He says, Consider the sower who went out to sow. As he was sowing, some seed fell along, along the path, the walkway, and the birds came and ate them up quickly. Others fell on rocky soil. There wasn't much soil. Yeah, it sprung up quickly. Since the soil didn't have any depth, when the sun came out, the seed was scorched, and since they had no root in themselves, no depth, the word just withered away. The seed just withered away. Others fell among thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them. And still others fell on good ground. Some produced a crop, one, 30, 60, and 100 fold, 100 times. Anyone who has ears to hear, let them hear. There are people that just don't invest too much in understanding God, nor do they want to. And so Jesus compares those people to wayside people. The, the, the seed just gets thrown on the wayside, and you have all this foot traffic, and wagons, and animals, and it gets trodden underfoot, and it really is just there, broken seed for the birds to come down and, and to devour. When Jesus talks in parables, if he talks about a field, he's talking about people. If he's talking about soil, he's talking about the condition of a man and a woman's heart. When he's talking about seed, he's talking about his word. And when the birds are involved, Rabbi, check me out, when the birds are involved, it usually means the devil is there to steal the seed. And birds in the Bible represent evil and darkness. And in this case, it's no problem for the devil to come and to take the word that's spread on the, the wayside and on the roadside. Now, some fell on rocky ground. Have you ever known people who receive the word gladly? And they have some soil, but you don't have to go down very deep to find out there's a certain hardness there. There's not a real openness. Their heart's really not that, not that um, uh, cultivated yet. And the word will spring up, but it will never last. Because if persecution comes, if trials and tribulation come, that word will be given up. It'll just go. It has no depth. It doesn't have the depth that it needs to grow. Now, God can take someone with the first and second soil and keep improving their hearts so the soil of their heart keeps improving. God can do that. But there's a, there's a third condition, and we see this condition. Both we see it in the unsaved world, we see it in the church, that there's some seed that gets thrown in and strewn among, on the soil, but there's thorns. In other words, 
There's deceitfulness of riches. There's the cares of this world. There's the worries and the commitment more to what the world has to offer than what God has to offer. The word can come up, but it just gets choked out because so many other things have value and have been given more value than the word of God and the sowing of the word of God in good soil. Then there's you. There's the good soil of your heart. And when you plant and when you water and when you nourish the seed, it'll come up first a blade. And then as you keep as you keep nourishing and keep adding to the word and you keep sowing, it grows up even more. And then one day before you know it, you've got a crop. That word has grown up in you and that crop produces power and strength. It has it came into you with spirit and life and when that crop grows up it'll come out of you with spirit and life that's the time that's the time you want to release it don't release the seed before it grows up into a crop I know some people they learn something and in their enthusiasm they run out and try to be somebody's teacher no give the Word of God time in you to grow up into a crop and as it's as it's growing into a crop keep planting as you harvest it keep planting God has a way of providing a crop and as he provides his crop he says I'll provide the word it will produce in you and it will be good as bread for the eaters and seed for the sower. God is always meeting your need through the word of God. He'll provide bread for you. And you can use bread in any kind of metaphor you want. But the word of God growing up in you will protect you, will provide for you, will sustain your life. It'll give you everything that you need to grow up in godliness. It's the divine nature of God in that seed. Isn't it amazing that the seed doesn't begin to grow until it dies? Isn't that amazing? It, something has to die for there to be a resurrection. And for the crop to come up, um, that seed will die. But as it, as it dies, it opens and new life comes out. I think God gave us the examples in nature simply so we could understand his spiritual principles and this is a resurrection principle so once the crop grows up and you keep planting and you begin to experience multiple uh, crops and you're living a victorious life one victory after another and spirit and life beget spirit and life you get on a roll have you ever been on a roll before it's just you could do no wrong it's like um, it's like a basketball player and the rim looks that big he just can't miss or a, a hitter a baseball player the ball looks so big he just can't miss it and he gets on this roll and God wants his church to be on a roll. God wants the momentum in the church to be such that he is the source of our, mo our momentum. And when God moves and he gives a church momentum and he's giving that to us right now, you're seeing momentum. You cannot stop the word of God from producing spirit and life. Amen. Things are multiplying because God is multiplying his word in you, in good soil. I think it was the spring of 2001. One series of events just kept happening right after another. Um, we had a, a 26 foot motorhome and every spring we'd come home and we decided to sell that motorhome because it was next October we were going to plant the church in Cabo San Lucas 
And we didn't have a place in Cabo to live, but we had a motorhome, and that, uh, something in my heart says, sell that motorhome. I borrowed a phone, because I didn't, in those days, I didn't use a phone. And I didn't miss it. I borrowed a phone and called a missionary friend on the other side of town who lived with his wife and two kids in a real nice fifth wheel trailer. And I said, Brent, can I use your place as an address and your telephone number? Uh, I want to sell my motorhome. 45 minutes, he came back. He came across town and said, as soon as you hung up the phone, a young man on a motorbike with a, a box strapped to the back and his dog in the box walked up to my motorhome and said, do you know a motorhome for sale? He said, I know, I know one that's for sale. Um, a friend of mine has a motorhome. It served him well. He's just going to sell it. He said, what's the price? He said, $10,000. The guy bought it for $10,000. Now, I'm going to use real numbers so you can see a real God working through real numbers. Kim and I went home that spring. We put $10,000 in our bank. And her, a, a lady from a newspaper, interviewed us because we were helping 12 children at a, a, a boy's home. The article, the article was posted in the newspaper and the Seroptimist group, that's the, the ladies, the optimist group is the men, the Seroptimist is the ladies. One of the ladies called Kim said, I'm the president of the Seroptimist Club and I'm reading this article about what you've done for 12 boys. Uh, is it okay if we nominate you for mother of the year? At that time, her husband, who really had cheated her out of child support for years, had the gall to file a lawsuit against her demanding for 50-something thousand dollars. She won the mother of the year. I told her, never go to court again without an attorney, because until you whack that guy a good one, He's going to keep bothering you, and he'll keep cheating you. She won the Mother of the Year Award, and her attorney walks into court with Kim um, being accused of, what's the term, a, a bad mother? Yeah, yeah. Unfit mother. And her attorney walks into court with plaques from the state and the city and pictures and awards in both hands and says to the judge so much for the unfit mother of the year and she won hands down I had we had a vehicle donation program and a man named Antonio ran the program so when I'm back you know I visit Antonio and he repairs cars and he picks them up and he sells them and the good cars we just give to missionaries and pastors in Mexico we gave more cars away in in that uh, springtime in that summer and God just decided because he can because he wants to he decided that he was going to bless us we didn't have a home we're going back to plant a church we didn't have a home in Cabo and so this friend of mine who has a really big vehicle donation program you might have heard about it mad mothers against drunk drivers i received a call from daryl daryl says you better get over here we have a a 40 foot fifth wheel uh trailer and i know you don't have a place in cabo why don't you come over here and take a look at it, it was beautiful in fact the man who owned it died and i knew him he was on my dock he was a boat neighbor and so I said, well, Daryl, this thing is awesome. How much are you asking? He says, for you, I'm asking $3,000. I said, I got $3,000. It's yours. And so now we own a 40-foot fifth-wheel trailer. But we didn't have a truck. I'm not saying God works everything in perfect order. 
but he does require that I hang in there and believe with him. The next, the next week, exactly one week later, Daryl says, we have three oversized trucks that will pull that trailer. One has a 15 ton uh, fifth wheel trailer hitch already on it and is rigged. Come on and take a look. I looked, it was the perfect, it was the perfect fit for that trailer. I said, well, Daryl, how much? He says, for you, $3,000. I have $3,000. And so Kim and I kept the truck and the trailer there till late summer, and we were getting ready to go back to Cabo with our new home. I then received a call from an associate professor at Hope International University who had been invited to teach a class in January. So October we were going to plant the church. In January, Richard Rincon was going to go down there and he said, Mike, I've just been given 14 boxes of literature, a lot of it, most of it in Spanish. And with a Mexican pastor, we've just prayed that God will use these messages and these pamphlets and these booklets to save souls. Do you have any way of getting them down to Mexico? I said, brother, you bring them over. I got just the vehicle. And so we packed 14 boxes of literature that they prayed over. Lord, send, send people, bring life, bring salvation, use this literature. We went down the Baja and handed out generously literature everywhere. I would preach in prisons. I had literature for everybody. Fast forward, January, we pick up Richard from the airport and he's bent over and he is in pain, his back. He did something to his back. We took him to our new castle. We laid him down on the sofa Kim made him lunch, and it was a Saturday, and I said, at 4 o'clock, Kim and I have to go. We're feeding the women and children at our, our Centro de Fe, our Mexican pastor's church, our sister church. He says, no, I'm going to go with you. And so Kim and I and Richard walk onto the property, and there's a, a boy there. I think he's about 10 years old. Um, do you remember his name? Joaquin. Joaquin. He was so downcast, he wouldn't even look up. His mother sent him to the church to sell chicharrones, and until he got all of his chicharrones sold, he couldn't join the other kids and play. And this was, this was a big party they were having. They were having a big party for all the children, and it was the first, it was the first meeting of the new year. I sent, I sent the youth pastors over to speak with him and to buy his chicharrones. And here's the story, he said. He said he and his sister and his mother had to flee the community because his father killed a man in a knife fight in town. And his father has been sentenced to the La Paz prison where he is now. And he said, my mother and my sister and I are living with our aunt and uncle who own a store just down the street and around the corner. Uh, we said, would you take us there? We got the Mexican pastor, Luis Lopez, and we all went down the street and around the corner, and I thought I was going to see a very scared woman. She wasn't scared at all. She was just as confident and, and bright. And I said, well, is it true what your son told me that you're... you're husbands in prison and that you've had to flee for your life? How come you're not afraid? She said, because at the church where we were, a man, a Canadian evangelist, showed the Jesus film one Friday night and I gave my heart to Jesus and all my fears went away. She opened up a bag. She said, here, she opened up a baggie and gave me a photograph of her husband. She took out of the baggie a piece of paper from a piece of literature in Spanish and gave it to Richard. 
And she began to tell the story about how a gringo pastor on December 22nd was escorted into the La Paz prison with other pastors, Mexican pastors, and 70 men came forward to receive the Lord, and her husband was one of them. And the gringo pastor had all this literature, and he handed out literature to her husband, who ripped one page out and sent it to her with his photograph, and then it, it dawns on me and Richard at the same time, I was the crazy gringo pastor in the, the La Paz prison on December 22nd. What are the odds? And then it dawns on me, and, and I thought I could, I could recognize him. And then, Richard realizes this, this is from one of the, the pieces of literature that he sent with us down the Baja, and it ended up in this lady's husband's hands in La Paz prison. The aunt and the uncle are hearing all this, and Luis Lopez, the Mexican pastor, has said, do you see what's going on here? Do you see what God has done to save this woman and her children and her husband? All that God did to make that happen to save one family. And then the aunt and the uncle gave their heart to Jesus. But the role wasn't finished. As an English church, for three years, we gave 58% of our income over to startup pastors and their churches. And we helped, we helped uh, plant and helped seven Mexican churches mature and become self-sufficient. And God was doing all of this. That year, we had over 100 people baptized and the role just kept going. I asked the Lord that year, do you still want me to do weddings? I said, just show me what you want me to do. And then I interviewed this Korean young couple from Vancouver, Canada. He was a real estate developer. She was a successful actress and was on a, a sitcom, a general hospital kind. And their friends were successful people. And as we talked to them, it became apparent that they have never received Jesus. And I said, I said, why don't you give your marriage to Jesus and give your life to him as well and ask other people, ask your friends if they would like to pray with you at the end of the wedding service. Kim was sitting out among 75 friends and James Edward Almos, the actor, remember Stand and Deliver, and he was there with his, his wife. Both of them were believers. And all around Kim, people were praying with this Korean couple to receive the Lord. Their parents, the parents of the bride and the groom, came up to see me and said, we have been praying for our children to receive Jesus for years. They had this full-on Korean regalia. Kim and I excused ourselves at one point, went over, it was at the Hilton, we went to the elevators to take the elevators up to the parking, the main floor, the parking lot, and James almost was there with his wife. So he gets in the elevator at the same time we get in the elevator, and he just stares at me. And I says, what? He says, I've never seen a wedding like that before. Three times that year, we had that same experience happen. When you get on a spiritual roll, and it's all about spirit and life, you cannot stop it. It's a runaway freight train. And God will see to it that it will never have to stop. Nathan, would you come up here, please? Now, as Nathan's coming up here, how many people have ever studied a well-made banana? Come on over here. There is some intelligent design behind everything in creation. And the maker of this banana uh, had the genius to color code it. Green, not ready. Yellow, 
just ripe. Brown, banana bread. Black, toss it. So the maker of the banana, not Dole, made the banana with five ridges, one, two, three, four, five, and he made the human hand with one, two, three, four, five ridges. So the maker of the banana made the hand suitable to receive the banana. And God just, the maker of the banana, God even made it to have a skin that falls over and drapes over the human hand just perfectly. And he even tilted the banana toward the human mouth. So God made the eating process that much easier. Except if you want to make it difficult and point it the wrong direction. But God, in his genius, has put seeds everywhere in nature as a testimony to what his seed will do. Nathan, would you cut that apple and show everybody what's in the middle of the apple? Here, let, let, let Gary help you too. Your, that thumb is concerning me. There we go. Okay. Now, Nathan, would you show everybody what is in that apple? You expected that, didn't you? You expected there to be seeds. Now, if you plant that seed, you won't get one more apple. The design of God is that you plant the seed and you get a whole tree full of apples at the appropriate season for years and years that God has put the seed in nature so it multiplies and it is a visible lesson to us that the Word of God is infinitely more capable of reproducing. Can you imagine what people would do if everybody on the planet started to plant their seeds? We'd have a planet full of apple seeds, apple trees. Yeah. Well now, Gary, would you help with the... Uh, I'm going to use this little small one here. Yeah. Because it has a really large seed in there. So we'll try that. Now, this is just a different kind of seed. This avocado seed, Angie gave Kim an avocado seed. She put it in water, put it out in the front porch, and it began to grow a tree. That's pretty cool. Show everybody that's a different kind of seed. But plant it, and it will grow. Gary, don't go away. <laughs> Let's try the grapefruit. Now this one. Can you saw it? Saw it. Just stay away. Watch you your thumb. Put your thumb up here. I'll just saw it. Get the thumb out of the way. Okay. Now it's no mystery. You're going to find seeds in a grapefruit. Try the, the cantaloupe. Can you, can you see the seeds in there? Yeah. yeah. Really. You have to look for them, but they're there. And a cantaloupe is designed to have seeds in it so that the seeds will multiply and produce an infinite number of more cantaloupes. Put your other hand up here. Here. Larry, since I got Gary up here, I'll just, I'll just use him. Whoa. Whoa. Okay. Try planting those and see what you get. God's pretty smart, isn't he? And he's pretty generous. That's what kind of creator he is. Now, Nathan, if you will take my machete. Can I just have my machete for a minute here? Um, I, I actually wanted a chainsaw because where we lived in Cabo, we had, um, yeah, settle down, Dennis. We lived in a tropical little forest, and so every year you had to trim. And everybody else got a chainsaw but me. Kim wouldn't let me have a chainsaw. She, she would not let me have power tools, and she knows me. And if you know me, you don't ever want to be around me if I have a power tool. I, in fact, I won't have a power tool. But she did let me buy a machete. Oh, man. Oh. Now, 
if you'll take this, and I want you to would you just let him hold it, and Gary, you grip it with him, and then I'm going to want you to raise it up high. Here, just practice for a moment. Raise it high, and when you come down, I'm going to ask you to chop through the watermelon. Now, at this moment, if you're in the front seat, you may be asking yourself, should I be moving somewhere else? And the answer is, possibly. But now, I'll raise it up. Now, hold on just a minute, because this is the way Gallagher started. Yes, he did. He did. He got, he got started this way. So, let's, let's see if you can just cut it completely in half with your strength and with Gary's strength. Go for it. Ready? That's okay. Now, what do you expect to find in a natural watermelon? You should have so much black seeds in there, but I got a seedless watermelon because I want to warn you that there is the real word of God that gets planted into your heart and there are many other philosophies in this world and opinions of men and people who would like to sell you on a woke philosophy or some other philosophy of men. Don't be faked out. Get the real watermelon with the real seeds when you have a chance to. And uh, we'll, we'll give all this to, uh, to Nancy and to Mary Ann if we can give this to you and feel free to help yourself to the banana, the watermelon, the cantaloupe, the grapefruit. I see Gary's already claimed the avocado. And the apple. I just want to encourage you to go through your day this week and ask yourself, what is the abundance and the capability of God when he plants, when he gives you his word that is infinite and you plant the holy word of God in your good soil? What's capable of being produced by God's word? More than any created fruit or crop ever. I want you to just be that confident that God's here to put you on on mission and to give your mission momentum and with his momentum that momentum cannot be stopped by man it'll just keep rolling so father we want to thank you Lord for the examples you give us all throughout nature that we can rely on you and as we sing this closing song we think of you and your abundance and how good you are to bless us overly overly over the top in all things and all ways in all days in all years of our life and we thank you rabbi